All right, great. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, my first question was going to be about you know the whole consensus layer nomenclature change, but you sort of already addressed it. But I'm sort of curious, like uh, you know, how was it like uh, deciding to go with that? You know, like nobody makes you go with it. Like certain client teams are holding out. Like, yeah, uh, you know it. We like to call it Ethereum 2 because it is such a radical change that it's it's literally a version 2 of Ethereum. And what it kind of feels like when you take that away, it kind of diminishes the, the impact of, of, of E2. But also looking at the other side of the coin, it has been confusing. The people are saying, well, is E2 a new coin? It's on Coinbase, is E2, and there's ETH, and they have a price that is exactly the same, but why? It's confusing. And ETH2, in the big picture of Ethereum, is, is, is a big historical event, but in, in the long span of Ethereum's lifetime to come, it's going to be a small event. And so we, we really have to, like, it's kind of hard for us to swallow our pride as, as, as developers who have kind of been spending many years to do this, but we'll say, all right, well, ETH2 has come and gone, and now we're just Ethereum, and it's all there. Because we're not going to say it for... We're going to do E3, E4, all this stuff. It's too confusing. I mean, Justin Drake would say yeah. E3. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And he'll say a date too, right? He'll name a date. <laughs> well, we could get into the uh, the research versus implementation divide, I guess. But that's probably, uh, we're here to talk about client diversity. Um, so uh, I guess I'm curious, like, when the first time you, you thought, like, oh, wow, this client diversity thing is a unexpected problem that feels great on the other hand and feels terrible on, on another, right? Yeah. You know, so Ethereum has this ethos where we need some redundancy, not just in um, the number of participants in the network, but also the software that's available. Uh, in Ethereum's history, there have been uh, major bugs with, with a certain client implementation at any given time. And having that alternative to switch to another one means that that we don't have to stop the world, but like things can keep moving along. Um, you can still use Ethereum uh, with that alternative. And so we took that same idea with ETH2. We said, all right, well, let's build this and we'll have redundant teams, redundant implementations in different languages. So if there's any bug or quirk or, or if a team stopped working on it for whatever reason, that there's options. Um, during this process, it, 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 it built a bit, a bit of healthy competition. You know, we all wanted to do the best we could do and, and, and be the client that everyone liked and, and uh, um, have a, a, a decent market share of, of validators. Um, but what happened was that it, it went way overboard, I would say. <laughs> um, we, it, it's, it's not a good thing to have one client be running everything, right? Like, it's cool to have an alternative, but if, if 90% or, or some really high number are all running one implementation, it would be uh, really noticeable if there was some catastrophic failure. And what ended up happening with ETH2 is that uh, um, Prismatic Labs that came with a great client, they were the first team to start working on it, or at least publicly start working on it. Um, they were really community engaged, and as a result, they, they have a lot of, of the market share, I, I guess, of, of the number of validators that are run. We don't know for sure, but we think that's the case today. So, Do you remember a specific moment where you thought, like, oh, this is, you know, like we've, we've done well in the competition, but yeah. like, oh, it's maybe too well. Like, is there one moment, like, I don't know, with maybe a Madaja or something before that or after that or... Yep. Yeah, we've always been aware that we have this massive responsibility that if we goof it up, then uh, it, it could be a big deal. And we had a test net called Madasha, and that's well well said for yeah. a non non <laughs> non Spanish non Argentine Spanish speaker. Yep. Um, and Madasha was this early test net pre launch of the Beacon Chain, uh, where it was mostly Prism um, dominated or entirely Prism. I, I don't recall, but we had this bug where everyone's clock had shifted to four hours in the future, and they started producing stuff four hours in the future, and then they went back to the present time. And then four hours later, everyone remembered what they did, and they started getting slashed because they were doing, doing the redundant, they, do, they were producing conflicting information for a, a point in time. 
And it really demonstrated um, this issue that if, if validators are getting slashed, you know, in mass, like everyone's getting slashed, like uh, it could actually uh, be catastrophic for, for E2 if it's the overwhelming majority, if it's more than two thirds, because you need two thirds to finalize. So that was a real wake up call for us. We said we need to take, you know, really take this responsibility seriously and make sure that, you know, that kind of bug can never happen. Uh, and that taking a step further is we need to encourage members of the community to help us reduce that risk. Because there's always a little bit of risk there, but we can mitigate this catastrophic scenario by saying Prism should never be more than 50% of the network market share. It should be, you know, in reality, it should be closer to 25%, but uh, actually is, is, is way too high right now. Do you have an that that makes me makes me wonder? Do you have an internal like KPI of like trying to get it below fifty? Or I think the theoretical yeah. like version is that nobody should be above thirty three percent. I actually don't think it's a big deal if we have two at forty percent. We maybe lose finality for a little bit, but yeah. Um, yeah, so we um, we do look at it from time to time, and it, it's a, a a bit of a community effort. There are metrics and dashboards and. We're trying to move the needle. Uh, what's been hard about it is that we've been shouting and screaming and waving our hands, and it seems like nothing's nothing's happening. Um, and so we've been trying to, you know, you know, really convey this importance. So if, if if you're a proof of stake validator today and you're running Prism, give another uh, uh, validator a try, especially with the new merge testnet. If you're going to try out the merge, just try it with a different setup. And then when, when the time comes, you say, well, actually, this client's still pretty good, maybe better than Prism, you switch. And that, that would really help out the network security, especially after the merge when the impact will be felt a lot more if there is ever a, a, a major event. So I'm actually the opposite, which is that I don't run any majority clients uh, in my validators, but I am running uh, Geth and Prism to, to test it, right, okay. um, for, the, for, the, for the current test that. So I'm doing the opposite of what you say. Um, um, I'm, I'm curious about like, do you ever talk to staking pools? Um, do, do they do they ping you? Do, like, you know, what? what um, I'm also like, when I talk to people, I'm always surprised at how few people seem to understand that it's actually like you made it really easy to switch. Like, it's actually very easy to switch. You take your node down for like, what is it like? I think 12 minutes, and you're basically guaranteed mm -hmm. to be fine, yep. and and migrate your slashing database, and like, you know. You'll be you'll be okay, and if you really want to be careful, keep it down for like a couple hours and like no big loss, right? Yeah, we you know we made it really easy. Um, it was it probably wasn't easy at first. I think the hard thing for people to understand is that there's an inherent risk by by not doing something, and there's also a risk with doing the switch. But the risk of not doing something may be greater than the risk of of uh, of switching. Um, like for example, if you're on a majority client and that majority client, you know, has an event forks off to its own invalid chain, then then you're stuck on there. You you can't really go back. Um, so yeah, you really need to look at that risk and say and, and and tell yourself like you know, hey, can I just read a couple of pages of documentation, spend a couple of hours on a weekend and do this? It's really not that hard, like Evan said. And you can try it in a testnet too. Like you don't have to. Go test in prod. You can do these practice over and over again. Practice new machines. Uh, practice trying to get yourself slashed on a test net, so you know what it's like. Like it, it, it really is. It's hard, actually. It, 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 it is really hard, actually. There's a lot of like guards that have been put in, and we really try to make the the operator error slashing risk as minimal as possible. It doesn't happen so much anymore. It happened a couple times in the beginning, but now it seems to be pretty good. So. Yeah, I, I tried on a test net once, and I actually I, I couldn't pull it off. And maybe that's because I'm just inept. But uh, you know, like it, it, it was surprising how hard it was, right? I mean, you have to like basically be running two at the same time and make sure that they're both both up. Yep. Um, um, so you know, I just said like Prism Prism Geth. Um, I think one message that is not getting out and is that like it's not just Prism, like Geth is also a majority client and we'll also have the same problem if Geth has 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 an issue. And of course, like, you know, it's been around for seven years, so it's like, you know, one of the most um, hardened clients in all of blockchain, really. But um, yeah, I don't know. 
how do we solve that one? I mean, how do we solve any of it? You know, like, is there, do you have any, any strategies that you think we are, we are underutilizing for, for either one? You know, I, Geth and, and these, uh, and, and Prism, if you've been running for a while, you're pretty comfortable with it. Um, and, and what comes with that, it's like, if, if something's not really bothering you and things are fine the way they are, it's really easy to stay in that, uh, that, that spot. Uh, I call it complacency. Um, in aviation, that's like the major killer of pilots is they get complacent. They're not, they're not staying up to date with things. They're, uh, really not looking, looking out the window and saying, what could I do to do better, even though things are perfectly fine. And that's the same scenario, I think, with Geth. Like, it's been an amazing client so far. Uh, it's, it's one of the most battle-hardened, like Evan said. It's just a really great client. But there are also other really great clients that are out there. And especially um, when, when, when the merge happens and, and the, the factors at play are considerably different, um, where there's stake to be lost or, or other scenarios, you, it's really a good opportunity to, to brief yourself on what's going on in the world with clients and make a switch um, that works best for you and, and, and helps the network. Yeah, I like what you said about, you know, like there's a risk of doing something, but there's a, a bigger risk of not doing something. And I think that's like a, an innate human, you know, psychological bias that I think has been really hard to overcome, especially from staking pools who, you know, I really thought that they were going to get it. And yet, I think they're sort of stuck in like some of the, you know, the other chains that have done a little more like centralized version of proof of stake where like it's all about uptime and they don't get that, you know, in, in Ethereum, it's not about, it's not about uptime. It's about more just decentralization. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, it's, it's funny. I don't know how like uh, to get that message through. And I feel like I've repeated it on Twitter on the bird app as much as I can. So it's like at this point, like what else do I do? You know, like, <laughs> Do you feel that way at all? Like, I mean, you like you tweet, you you know, you write blog posts, and you know, people don't 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 care. Yeah, it seems like they don't care, right? We're we're t t saying like, look, this is important. Something really bad might happen if you don't do it, and then nothing happened. Like, no one's doing anything. It it's tough. And with the staking pools, yeah, they they are trying so hard to have the highest uptime, the highest profitability. They're even doing stuff that's really risky. We've seen slashing events where. They're doing like crazy stuff to try to get just a, like one more nine on their three nines of uptime or whatever. Um, we say to them, you know, think of it as like a, an insurance policy or some kind of hedging of this kind of event. Like you don't have to go abandon ship on Prism, but maybe put half of it on something else or even like come up with um, uneven distribution. Say there's four great clients out there, split up your keys into equal buckets of four and, and meter them, measure them, and look from time to time. You can adjust it, but to put all your eggs in one basket is not a great idea. So think of it as an insurance policy of, of any kind of event. I'm, I'm sort of curious to ask about, like, um, I know this is like a little bit of, a, of an oddball curve, but like, how do you feel about clients in the future? You know, like, um, like we're, 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 we're unbundling a lot of stuff like with this whole, like with the, with the current roadmap that we have. Right. And you could see a lot of ways that, you know, that it could change, you know, like, especially with like, um, the number of clients that are using Geth, for example, is like, you know, every blockchain out there is like a Geth fork, frankly. Right. Like, I think, I think people know that. Or maybe people don't know that. Like almost every blockchain, like competing Ethereum, like blockchain is like a Geth fork. I mean, like it, at least 75% of them. Um, and then all of the like the roll-ups are too. Um, yeah, I mean, um, like, do you do you have any thoughts? Is like, you know, like, do you do you think there's a world where it just ends up like everyone has their own, like, you know, fork of Geth that is like starts diverging? You know, where these all teams like compete to you know get their new thing into Geth? Like, um, I don't know if this is too weird of a question. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great question. And and what's what I love about Ethereum is there's so much of a social layer. It's not just technology. Like making these choices um, is 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 a bit about and encouraging people to make different choices is a diff, it's a social difficult thing to do. Um, and then with with other like blockchains, like of course uh, with Ethereum, we welcome use of open source software, um, but also like you know you. You should understand why Ethereum is doing a multi-client world is because 
there are these inherent risks of having a single client. And when, um, when you have so much complexity, like, like Bitcoin, for example, is relatively lower complexity than these other blockchains with uh, different uh, virtual machine environments. They can afford to have a, a central client because you know there's not a whole lot being changed or developed, being upgraded, not a whole lot doing. It's just doing a few things and doing those well. But then when you have like something that says I'm going to do what Ethereum does, but do it better or add these features in, then you uh, of all of all projects really need to take this seriously because you're even adding more complexity, and uh, and, and that comes with more risk. So you, you should really be taking a look at that. Well. Um... I think that's I think that's it for me. Um, it's an honor to be up here with you. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, yeah, you thank go. you. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Preston.